Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, beautiful Evergreen College. It's our 50th uh, anniversary this year. We are a, um, a pretty uh, beautiful and sort of wily place, and we, um, we want to celebrate this year. We have um, a great lineup. This is the art lecture series for fall. My name is Shaw Osha and I organize it, uh, but I couldn't do it without the help of people who work with me to make it happen. So Julie Ron, Dave and Raul from um, in the media people and all of the student interns that help both uh, with the Zoom webinar and the recordings. And we have a beautiful library of the recordings. And I'll show you that in a minute. But first, I want to take a moment to um, participate in um, something, a tradition that we, that's been fairly recently started, but it, that is that really to, to um, redefine how we place ourselves in relation to histories that we have we were we came into but that have been grossly misrepresented so i want to honor the indigenous people's kinship to and stewardship of this land and the fact that they have not and cannot be erased and with that i want to acknowledge that we have a longhouse that is an essential and active presence in our campus and we also have an indigenous pathway that is also essential to this campus, the Evergreen State College is located on the ceded territories of the Medicine Creek Treaty Tribes, which include the Squaxin Island Tribe, the Nisqually Island Tribe, and the Puyallup Tribes of Indians. That Olympia was, this area was historically a center for trade and exchange among many Salish Sea Tribes, including the Chehalis and Skokomish um, and others. And it was acquired through actions of, um, of colonial, colonialism and um, coercion and thievery. And um, so with this awareness, I just wanna honor these, the ancestors that were here and pay respects to the elders past and present of um, all these people. I'm gonna share my screen and take you to our website. And this website was um, started and helped by also a student worker, um, Steve Orth. So I wanna uh, ask, to thank Steve for putting the work into getting this to be um, a better and more accessible website. So up at the top, the home will show you this quarter's upcoming presentations. Today we have James Spooner. Um, week four, we have Chris Martin, and he's be gonna be joined by Sid Gosh, and Chris is a poet, uh, most recently published Things to Do in Hell, um, has won numerous awards, and is also the executive director of Unrestricted Interests an organization dedicated to helping neurodivergent learners transform their lives through writing. And Sid Gosh is a non-speaking autistic poet with Down syndrome who will be joining um, Chris on in week four. Uh, week, this is uh, week six, November 3rd. Be Another Lab is an international interdisciplinary art science research laboratory uh, that will be coming to talk about the intersection of art, science, and technology, and with ideas of overlapping not only bodies of knowledge, but bodies, uh, perception of self, and I think with, uh, with empathy as well as one of their concerns. And then in week eight, Nancy Huang um, will be coming in, zooming in from New York, talking about her practice, is, which is a social practice where she works with the public to do things like wash their hair um, in a public park in New York or lie down with them on a, on a bed and have conversations. Um, and, and she's currently working on uh, a piece in a park in New York 
where she's making dinner for the houseless people in that area, I think specifically women. And at the top of this is, will be the upcoming lectures, which is today and the past lectures. And it gives you a, a listing of who spoke during the, that particular year. And then we have a video gallery um, where you can watch most of those really, some of them really fantastic talks. So I'm going to hand it over to Jasmine Brognax and, um, and Jasmine is, will then introduce James. Good day to you all. My name is Jasmine Brodnax, as Professor Osha just mentioned. And the program that I, as well as some of the fellow students in this meeting are in is Ampersand Hybridity in Visual and Narrative Art, which is head by Professor Coffey and Professor Osha. Uh, firstly, I would like to say I'm extremely grateful to attend a college which recognizes many of its imperfections allowing each student to fluidly move through some heavyweight topics. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to introduce James Spooner, a self-proclaimed tattoo artist, illustrator, and filmmaker, and if I may add, creative connoisseur and philanthropist. The form of art we will be discussing is a film with clear recognition of knowledge and sound and tastefully written interview questions. The overall work moves us through an alternative perspective on an already alternative subject, the Afropunks. Moving throughout America, focused mainly on metropolitan areas such as New York and LA, but not only, we find that blackness isn't as contrary to punks as we would first think. Um, with rock and roll N-word, punching our eyes out in the opening scene, your mind is almost primed for some sort of harsh reality to come when instead a wholesome encounter of inner love and self-experimentation takes the reins. Um, as a co-founder of so many narratives and spaces in need of insight, Mr. Spooner really began an open discourse between crowds in need of true recognition and not assimilation. As a fellow human of the alternative crowd and as a student body of Evergreen State College, I'm eager to introduce Mr. James Spooner. Uh, hi, I hope everything's good here. Um, real quest, just a tech question here. It's asking me to unmute myself on the laptop. Should I, I should not do that, right? Okay. Um, okay, so hi, uh, thanks for having me, all of you guys. And um, I uh, look forward to this opportunity to share some of my story with you and uh, hear some of your questions and share. Okay. So, um, okay, so I'm starting in 2003. So I've already made the movie, I've already screened it a bunch of times and um, I'm starting to think about um, getting the, basically, I just wanna go back to 2003 real quick, all right? Let me get, turn this off. So back then I felt like black people had very limited um, avenues to express themselves. There, you, you know, the mainstream was pushing this kind of Jay-Z, um, puffy, like pop and bottles, jiggy era type thing. And the only like comfortable alternative to that uh, was kind of like the bohemian uh, neo-soul thing, right? And I really believe neo-soul started as a reaction to the Jiggy. You know, as a 20-something year old in New York, found myself in both of those spaces, but they never really felt completely authentic. Um, you know, I felt like all of these people do on, at times good things for the community, but I didn't really feel like they were the community. So I wanted to add another lane for black people. And at that point, um, I felt like Afropunk could potentially open up a new lane. Um, and uh, I could introduce uh, the, the more mainstream black community to 
um, some of the ethics and morals that come with punk rock, uh, um, namely the DIY uh, aesthetic and um, you know culture. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So uh, you know, just to back up a little bit, there is a buzz around the film. I'd done a hundred screenings that year, two thousand three. Um, and, uh, the buzz was really happening, you know? So I thought that like, I could start doing some shows, some, uh, putting on bands and stuff, uh, in the hopes of building a scene. This was around when I brought on, um, Matthew Morgan, who, uh, was the longtime CEO. He was, uh, just fired last year. Um, so, um, you know, so Matthew and I, uh, this is very early stages, uh, for, before the festival, we started the liberation sessions, which was basically just, uh, uh my film would play, it would bring people, you know, we usually get like 80 to hundred people to come see the movie. And then we would have three or four bands play. Uh, meanwhile, upstairs, there was a uh, DJ usually playing like house or um like disco and whatever you know so really just trying to like bring uh open-minded black folks into the space um and uh you know they were really successful i uh made it a mission you know what i learned from you know way back in the day was that like really all you have to do is invite people and they will come, you know? So I wanted to have a black space for punk rock. So I went out of my way to invite black people. I'd go walk down the street, I'd see somebody who looked like remotely alternative and I'd walk up to them and be like, hey, you know, I want you to come to this event. And, uh, you know, they came. And uh, I had like, this was like my, my dream come true of like a nearly all black MOSFET. You know, it was like uh, something I never thought was possible when I was uh, in the process of making the film. At the same time, um, the, uh, I started, myself and some of the member, people who were in the film started the message board on the Afropunk website. And it was very rudimentary. There was no, uh, you know, at the time, the only social media was MySpace. So this was like a really um, robust environment for um, black alternative kids to get together and like talk around the country. They obviously weren't all in New York and they wanted to like, um, you know, we needed to, I felt like, I wanted to give them something as well. Uh, the community really started to grow it's on it organically and take, uh, and, and the people were really beginning to um, make friendships and stuff. Um, and these have been lifelong friendships. Even today, there are several, like probably 50 people from the message board who uh, locally still hang out. There are people who got married off the message board. There are people who have children off of the message board. It was, you know, it was like a real community come to life. And these people all wanted to get together and, um, and meet, you know? So um, I, uh, I coming off the heels of a, a really successful screening at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, uh, kind of put the dots together and, uh, Matthew and I started the, um, came up with the idea of doing the Afropunk Weekend, which uh, was the first like Afropunk Fest. And um, this was, um, you know, it was, there was a film component back then, um, which was like kind of all black re revolutionary film um, or film that dealt strongly with, um, identity, black identity. Um, 
there was three concerts that took place like at various places in the city, like CBGB's and Southpaw and um, the Delancey. And, uh, and we also had a picnic that was very kind of impromptu and um, one of my favorite parts. For me, Afropunk has always been about community and any time that I was able to put together an event where the focus was on the community rather than the stage, those were kind of the best, the best ones. Um, and it was really a success, you know, uh, these are some pictures from, um, you know, it went like this for like three years. So these are some pictures from, from that time period. So, you know, over that, the course of those three years, we did like silly things like the Afropunk prom and an Afropunk picnic, um, pajama parties. Um, and through the message board, people in Chicago and Atlanta, they were like meeting up on their own. And at that point I was starting to feel like, okay, this is a real, this, this could be a real scene because this is not just one person or a company that's like organizing, but people are doing things on their own, you know? It was very authentic and it's very genuine. And I really want you to like take the time to look at these kids' faces and like the, uh, it, it, I mean, when I look at it, it's just, it's so heartwarming. I know almost everyone in this crowd and, uh, you know, there's something to be said for that. So for it to go from this to this, uh, a mega festival that's in six countries, I knew that there were going to have to be compromises. And the thing that was going to be most compromised uh, was the punk part. And uh, for that, be because of that, um, it, that led to my de departure. Um, basically, in a nutshell, it was capitalism that drove me out. I knew that I wouldn't be able to adhere to my values if this thing was going to um, continue to grow in the way that it, it was. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about some of the compromises that were uh, that I had to deal with in the last year of me being part of Afropunk. Please keep in mind that this at this point, 2008, the festival is uh, it's the first time being outdoors. It's the first time having sponsors, and it maybe had like 20,000 people come, like maybe over a course of, at that time, nine days, um, which is insane. But um, if, so when you hear about these stories, you can safely amplify them by now the festival is like 80,000 people um, per day in, you know, in all of these different countries. So just, you know, amplify the story would probably be safe, you know? Um, so if it looks like I have a headache here, it's because I did. Um, so I was, um, I had a moment where I was sponsored by Toyota, which meant that I blogged for them. And, um, and they gave me this car. Thankfully it didn't have all that stupid shit on it, but you know, they gave me a car. They want me to like talk about like my, my like life and every so often mention the car, you know? And at the time it seemed like, okay, I'm gonna get a free car and I just have to do what I like doing, which is like partying and writing, you know? <laughs> so no big deal. So I went and I, um, I wrote about this night that uh, I went to visit, I went to meet my friend at a bar, it was a drag, a uh, gay bar and they had like a drag night and it was, it was fun. It was, you know, it was great. Who doesn't like drag queens? So I, uh, I wrote about it, posted it. And like 10 minutes later, uh, I get a call from the agency that's representing Toyota. And they tell me, um, 
we have to take down that post, you know, it's funny, but it doesn't appeal to our target demographic. Um, essentially telling me that the, the black men 20 to 30 that they're trying to appeal to with their campaign um, are homophobic, you know, in their estimation. Um, at the festival, there was a, um, much to my chagrin, I was not able to book the majority of the festival. And there was, um, of, the, of the, the acts that performed and Matthew was dead set on having a day of hip hop bands. Um, this was like a big departure for us, but um, I didn't really have, I didn't feel like I had a strong say at that point. And uh, one of the acts did a uh, cover of a dance hall medley. And one of the songs they did was a cover of, of um, Buju Bantan's Boom Bye Bye, which is uh, quite literally about killing gay people. So, um, after their song was over, I got on stage and I um, basically embarrassed them and told the audience that this is not what Afropunk is about. This is absolutely not what punk is about. And if it wasn't for the gay members of our community, this festival wouldn't even be happening, um, which was literally true because probably 70% of our volunteer staff um, and paid staff was queer. So, um, that sucked. Um, and then lastly, uh, you'll see that one of the sponsors there is Mountain Dew. And what was, you know, they were paying for uh, the event to be free and all ages and built a skate park. And I felt kind of excited about that. Um, but it was weird because when all the soda came in, because it was giving away free soda, obviously. Um, the vast majority of it was red and I'd never even seen or heard of Red Mountain Dew at that time. So just kind of like inquiring, like why, what's, where's the green Mountain Dew, you know? And uh, the response that I got was that um, their target market research shows that black people like red drinks. Um, I'm just gonna, imagine you guys all gasping right now because that's what I did. It, it was very offensive, you know? And, um, and then they went, and then I was asked, you know, hey, can you go take pictures of that group of kids over there um, getting the sodas so we can send it to our sponsors and show them that kids love their drink, right? Um, and I did it. And this picture right here is to me, I'm so glad that it exists because this here is my sellout moment. If, if all the other stuff was, I mean, all the other stuff felt kind of sellout-ish too, but right here, I, there's evidence, you know, there's clear evidence of me compromising everything um, for these sponsors. And I just couldn't deal. You know, um, I just don't have the stomach for that. And what I, you know, I started Afropunk. I wanted to start a real revolutionary black movement. Um, and I think what I realized in this experience is that movements can't be led by LLCs. And, and um, yeah. So I left. Um, I think I'm gonna leave the slideshow here um, just so we have time for questions if that's cool.